Hi guys. Well, it's finally starting to feel a little bit like spring here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on this beautiful Easter weekend. It is Saturday, <coughs> April 8th, 2023, somewhere along there. So I have two picking parties to get to, the little dog and I, and I... <coughs> So let me get <coughs> right into this. Excuse me, little dog. This is uh, over there from those little lefties over at TruthDig. TruthDig.com. And uh, I have to say, I mean, all kidding aside, I uh, kudos and three cheers to the little lefties at TruthDig for doing some uh, serious digging up of the truth. And you better believe there's a lot of little lefties like AOC and her gang of clueless morons uh, in a with their panties in a wad today over this. So, uh, you know, whenever uh, Fox News and Truth Dig uh, agree on something, uh, you might want to listen to it. And this is, I guess that Truth Dig is starting a, uh, a whole, I guess this is going to be a series called Green Tinted Glasses. Absent from most public and policy conversations is any acknowledgement, any acknowledgement of the possibility that renewable energy cannot power a high consumption civilization. This series will explore mounting evidence that a major downshift in consumption is looming and explore the implications of this energy realism for human progress and flourishing, this is some fellow named Christopher Ketchum who is putting this series together. And so the chapter one of this series is called The Green Growth Delusion. The Green Growth Delusion. And guys, I, I, I've got to say... If you spend one hour of your life, if you're if you're just getting down in this rabbit hole, or even if you've been here and, and want to see where it is spelled out uh, in, in, in one unambiguous, in-your-face <coughs> truth dig uh, uh, about the, one of the single biggest, well, it's a whole pack of... The, if you haven't read Bright Green Lies and just kind of want to sum up Derek Jensen's Bright Green Lies into one place, I will put the link on here. You need to read uh, this um, excellent spot-on essay about the, the absurdity uh, the, the very term green growth. All right, there is no such thing as green growth. Uh, anyway, I, I'm not going to have time uh, to read this whole thing. Uh, we'll read the opening and we're going to get into some interviews that he had with William Reese. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> the green growth delusion by Christopher Ketchum. <clears throat> Advocates of green growth promise a painless transition to a post-carbon future. But what if, <clears throat> what if the limits of renewable energy require sacrificing consumption as a way of life? Well, I guess we're getting ready to find out, and I'm just going, well, dive in here and spend about a half hour 
this and you have got to go on the link and read this yourself. But anyway, take it away, Christopher Ketchum. <clears throat> In the annals of industrial civilization, the Green New Deal counts as one of the more ambitious projects. Its scale is vast, promising to reform every aspect of how we power our machines, light our homes, and fuel our cars. At this late hour of ecological and climate crisis, the Green New Deal is also an act of desperation. Our energy ravenous culture cannot continue producing carbon without destroying the systems that are the basis of any advanced civilization, not to mention life itself. Something must be done, and quickly, to moderate the pressure on the atmosphere <clears throat> at the atmospheric sink while powering the economic machine. The consensus on the need for scaling up renewable energy is rarely disturbed by a disquieting possibility. What if techno-industrial society as currently conceived based on an ever-increasing GDP, global trade and travel, and complex global production and distribution change, chains designed to satisfy the rich world's unquenchable appetite for bigger, faster, more of everything. What if that simply cannot function without energy-dense fossil fuels? <clears throat> what if, despite the promises of the, the promises of Green New Deal boosters, it is impossible to make sustainable the current system that provides billions of people sustenance, shelter, and goods. This possibility is not mentioned thanks to the dominance of green growth. <clears throat> this is the idea that the organizing principles of our civilization, endless growth of economies and populations can be decarbonized swiftly in a way that will involve no material disruption. Green growth holds out the promise of transitioning away from fossil fuels directly into something like an earth-friendly utopia without a hitch and without meaningful sacrifice. This is the sales pitch offered by Green New Deal proselytes such as Ezra Klein, the New York Times columnist and podcaster who brings a relentless optimism to the belief, the faith that renewables can underwrite business as usual. So anyway, so the next section of this, which I'm going to skip over because I don't want to uh, insult your intelligence, what Christopher does here is, is he just goes through the hopium-soaked apocaloptimism pack of bright green lies that Ezra Klein, AOC, uh, Paul Krugman, uh, all of these clueless morons, these politicians and economists uh, talking this unadulterated horse shit. Uh, I don't need to uh, remind you of that. <clears throat> 
less likely to appear in the pages of leading magazines or those with a more skeptical view about building carbon-free societies within a few decades. But these are far from marginal voices. Um, <clears throat> when a group of scientists writing for the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences took a look at, uh, you know, these green boosters, wind, water, solar plan back in 2017, they found it was based on, quote, errors, inappropriate methods, and implausible assumptions. Uh, it, it, anyway, guys, and then he launches in to all of these people, you, you, you know, these, the, these real, these scientists, uh, these ecologists and climatologists and whatnot, <coughs> looking into this and blowing the bullshit whistle. Here is one study going all the way back to six. 2016, where the academics Patrick Moriarty and Damon Honnery argued that, uh, you know, basically blowing, blowing the whistle on this, and as good as this stuff is, and you need to read this, I want to move ahead, uh, so he he, he really looks at this research, then he moves to a fellow named Ted, uh, Ted Trainer, a lecturer at the University of New South Wales and founder of the Simplicity Institute has reached a similar conclusion, quote, <clears throat> The limits to renewable energy have been almost totally ignored as a topic of study. Uh, close quote. Um, <clears throat> the Ezra Kleins of the world adhere to what Trainer calls the tech fix faith. I call it the techno utopians, which is marked by the assumption that there is no need to shift from present energy and resource intensive lifestyles and systems or from an economy driven by market forces, the profit motive, and of course, growth. Uh, and, then, and then he moves on uh, talking about energy and systems theorist Vaclav Smeal, uh, who I've mentioned uh, here before, quoting uh, some of uh, some of Vaclav. Unfortunately, Vaclav Smeal declined to be interviewed uh, by, the, by Christopher Justice. Vaclav declined to be interviewed by me. But just looking at some of his former writings, Smeal has declared, quote, the rapid speed transformation narratives in the renewable field to be so full of magic prescriptions that they are, quote, the academic equivalent of science fiction from his book last year, which I've talked about, How the World Really Works, uh, Smeal writes, quote, heavy doses of wishful thinking are commingled with a few solid facts. Um, <clears throat> to understand this mis mismatch, it is necessary to look closely at how we use <coughs> our prodigious amounts of energy. That picture is very different from the one found in Green New Deal presentations full of high-speed rail projects 
and windmills. Uh, anyway, guys, just, uh, I have to skip ahead. Uh, Smeal declined to be interviewed, saying in an, in an email, quote, we are dealing with people who, despite receiving relevant education, refuse to acknowledge basic physical and mathematical facts that a global decarbonation, decarbonization is impossible by 2030 or 2040 is beyond any reasonable dispute. Uh, Smeal is talking here about decarbonization of existing energy demand. And then he goes from, Will, from uh, Vaclav Smeal uh, over here talking about my hero William Reese. If you haven't heard my interview with William Reese, if you go to my interviews playlist, I think that William is the lead-off interview. Uh, <clears throat> as long as this subject, you, you know, talking about as long as the subject of bright green lies and the green growth delusion, as long as this subject is politically off limits <clears throat> in every major economy today, Smeal agrees with sustainability scholar William Reese who has concluded, quote, the politically acceptable is ecologically disastrous, while the ecologically necessary is politically impossible, close quote. There is no political system on this planet. No matter how lefty utopian they are, there is no political or economic system on this planet in place who is going to have the balls to admit ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Guys, this is the single, well, one of the single biggest lies being rammed down our throats by the little greeny lefties. Ain't gonna happen. If it did happen, it would be every bit as bad ecologically, probably worse than fossil fuels. The fire is worse than the frying pan. The cure is worse than the disease. This whole green revolution will kill this planet. Is there anybody down here in the Dumasphere uh, questioning this anymore? It's crap. Uh, Reese is among the most veteran and eloquent of dissenters from the green growth faith in his 45 years at the University of British uh, <clears throat> Columbia. Reese became known for his work in ecological economics, which understands the economy as embedded in biophysical processes and not comprehensible outside those processes. <clears throat> Among GNDers, uh, gr among Green New Dealers, Reese is just another scold. I love that, uh, you, seeing the word scold uh, as, as, a, uh, as a noun, for asking whether the idea of powering industrial civilization with renewables amounts to what Reese calls, quote, little more than a shared illusion, close quote. Well, Christopher and I would call it a delusion. 
Um, <clears throat> like Smeal, Reese draws our attention to serious concerns about the biophysical limits to green growth. Uh, in 2021, Reese and co-author Megan Siebert um, declared that green orthodoxy, quote, views the world through a narrow keyhole that is blind to innumerable economic, ecological, and social cost, you know, of this BS renewable transition. They agree with Smeal that Green New Dealers, quote, advance no viable solutions for electrifying the many high heat intensive manufacturing processes involved in constructing high tech wind turbines and solar panels, including prominently cement and steel production. Waste streams generated by renewables at the end of their working lives are either ignored or assumed away to be dealt with by yet non-existent recycling processes. Critically, they charge Green New Dealers also, quote, fail to address how the gigatons of metals and minerals essential to building renewable energy technologies will be available in perpetuity. Uh, close quote. Siebert and Reese note that the transition of the U.S. electrical supply, this is just the electrical supply, away from fossil fuels by 2050 would require an astonishing increase in the rate of grid construction amounting to an estimated 14 times that of the rate over the past half century. The same goes for wind and solar plant construction. To achieve 90% decarbonization and electrification by 2035, the U.S. quote, would have to quadruple its last annual construction of wind turbines every year for the next 15 years and triple its last annual construction of solar PV every year for the next 15 years and then repeat this colossal manufacturing endeavor indefinitely as solar panels and wind turbines have average lifespans of around 15 to 30 years. Fossil fuels, of course, are needed for every step of renewables manufacturing, writes Siebert and Reese, quote, the espoused technologies are not renewable. Their production from mining to installation is fossil fuel energy intensive and producing them, particularly mining their metals and discarding their waste, entails egregious social injustices and significant ecological degradation." Close quote. And then what uh, Christopher Ketchum does is he dives in to William Reese and other, the, the whole notion of the ecological footprint, not just the carbon footprint, the ecological footprint, uh, which is, which I've gone over and then they, um, he, he separates the ecological footprint from its close cousin, the material footprint. The material 
footprint focuses on the extraction and use of materials in the global economy. Material footprint is a major driver of biodiversity loss and other ecosystem pressures. In the U.S. and other high-income countries, material footprint per capita increased by nearly 50 percent between 1990 and 2008, driven by the pursuit of growth, capital accumulation, and consumerism. Today, material use in these countries overshoots sustainable levels by a factor of four. All of this ecological impact gets swept under the rug when we focus only on carbon emissions. Yes, we need to reduce emissions and fast, but we all so need to pay attention to other equally dangerous impacts which are not addressed at all by mainstream green new dealers. Uh, and there you go. Here we are uh, again. Uh, I was just reading this uh, essay yesterday by this fellow saying, while all of the little greenies' eyes are focused on one chart, which is the rising greenhouse gas emissions charts, while all eyes are focused on there, there are 800 other charts that nobody is paying attention to that are also cratering today. And these little greenies, they don't want to hear it any more than the Fox News uh, swillers. They don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to face the truth dig. All right. Rising materials gluttony is a global scourge. So here is a couple of factoids. The annual global extraction of materials, you know, when the population of this planet was one-third of what it is today, the annual global of ex extraction of materials in 1970 was 27 billion tons. It was 70, 70 billion tons in 2010 and 92 billion tons in 2017. Meanwhile, per capita, global material use went from 7 tons in 1970 to 12 tons in 2015. According to the report, there is growing environmental pressure per unit of economic activity that directly contradicts green growth claims that market and tech efficiency have streamlined the pillage of the earth. Uh... And then, of course, modeling a future scenario that assumes business as usual uh, will hit 190 billion tons by 2060 and double the current rate. And per capita material use will rise to a stunning 18 and a half tons. Um, in the, quoting the report, in the absence of urgent and concerted action, the organization warned, in what reads like a classic understatement, rapid growth and inefficient use of natural resources will continue to create unsustainable pressures on the environment. 
the urgency in mainstream circles to deal with greenhouse gases stands in stark contrast to the total silence over our ravenous churning through the raw stuff of the planet. Um, good Lord. And then uh, here is... Uh, this is from the Electric Power Research Institute warning uh, last year, quote, achieving U.S. net zero energy would involve an energy transformation that is unprecedented in scope and scale, close quote. The rise in demand for critical metals for a renewables build-out is expected to range from 700% to an astonishing 4,000%. Bill Reese estimates that in the next 35 years, with the doubling of the world economy, the quantity of minerals required for the presumed energy transition will be equal. Okay, this is Bill Reese. Next 35 years, the, you know, the green energy transition will be equal to all of the minerals ever consumed to date in the course of human history. Uh, quoting Bill Reese, we are projecting more consumption and pollution impacts anticipated in the next 35 years than in the previous 300,000. Let that sink in. This is why, you know, they did not interview Tim Garrett in here. That Tim Garrett talking about this very thing in my interview with him says it can't happen cannot happen. This isn't a debate. We cannot use in the next 35 years as much of this planet as we've used for the past 300,000. Ain't gonna happen. Something's gonna break. This civilization is going down. Uh, says energy analyst Mark Mills, who I've mentioned agreeing with, uh, with Reese, quote, if it were to be achievable, this would be the largest single increase in demand and supply of metals in all of human history. It has never happened. And of course, I would add, ain't gonna happen. It is not going to happen if we get halfway there where we're killing this planet. Anyway, uh, <coughs> guys, this goes on and on and on and on. Uh, then they talk about the absolute joke of decoupling, of decoupling uh, the, the, uh, economy, uh, I I I anyway, that whole thing, I could, uh, I, I could do an entire channel, um, uh, Hickel and other degrowthists point out that the only way the only way we can feasibly decarbonize fast enough to meet the Paris Agreement goals and reduce other ecological pressures is to scale down industries and activities that we obviously do not need. Uh, and that, again, is why it ain't gonna happen degrowthists entertain the heretical idea 
that a more uh, a more uh, hopeful future requires more than the hyper development of green technology uh, to displace fossil fuel. But this alternative uh, hopeful future does not maintain GDP growth or strive to constantly increase economic complexity. If we are to avoid ecological collapse, we must take the opposite path, one of contraction and simplification, a downsizing of the economy and population. Ah, do I hear downsizing the population so that Homo sapiens can prosper within the regenerative capacity of the biosphere. In other words, we must live within our planet's biophysical limits. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, but then, of course, you know, as they explain, there is no economist or a politician, including AOC. Uh, there, there, there is nobody, uh, no economist or, or, well, other than Umer Hack or politician who are going to get on board with what we, uh, what we need to do, and then uh, they, he, he closes with these absurd claims from this clueless moron economist Paul Krugman, uh, writing his horseshit in the New York Times. I asked Hickle for a degrowthist assessment of Krugman's claims. Quote, Krugman and anybody spouting the horseshit coming out of Paul Krugman's mouth, Krugman simply does not know what he's talking about. There is a large scientific literature on the issues he addresses which he does not engage. If we want to stop climate breakdown and every other kind of breakdown. We need urgent, rapid, and far-reaching changes to how our economies work, yet Krugman would have us believe that everything is more or less fine." Close quote. And Christopher closes with, in the near future, we may look back on the sunny green growthism of Krugman and Klein as a form of denialism, one that we could not muster the courage and imagination to confront when we had the chance. But of course, uh, the last time we had that chance was 1970, when the population was one-third of what it is, and the economy is one-fourteenth of what it is today. But guys, anyway, I skipped over more than half of that. You've got to go on the link and read that entire thing uh, from uh, beginning to end. Anyway, I've got to wrap this up because I have two picking parties to get to in my gas-sucking truck, and I have to go uh, whip up some uh, planet-killing uh, avocados to make some guacamole. I highly suggest you get out there and make some guacamole while you still can. Bye, guys.